Hello, I welcome you to the next lecture on EU-Russian relations and today we are going to talk about economic relations between Russia and the European Union. Economic relations between Russia and the European Union are probably the biggest part of uh, EU-Russian relations if we talk thematically. And this is due to the fact that the European Union is uh, mostly an economic player and less so a political player or a player in the field of um, internal affairs. And at the same time, it is due to the geographical proximity and the dance of various economic links between Russia and the European Union. But let's look at it in more detail. If we look at the partnership and cooperation agreement at first, uh, 80 out of 89 substantial articles of the partnership and cooperation agreement deal with economic relations. And this is quite telling that actually uh, sends us already a very powerful signal of how important economic relations are. Uh, economic relations uh, have uh, undergone a substantial evolution. If we look at the uh, provisions of the partnership and cooperation agreement, uh, they are quite interesting. Article 3, for example, talks about a possibility of establishing a free trade area. Yes, already at the turn of the 1990s, Russia and the European Union thought about a free trade area. It hasn't come into being yet, and it remains to be seen when it will come into being, but still it's, uh, it's a, it, it has been a long-standing goal. And Article 55 of the Partnership and Cooperation Agreement talks about legal approximation. It basically says that Russia will align its legislation with that of the European Union. Yeah? So it's a unilateral uh, alignment of Russia. Yeah? So the Partnership and Cooperation Agreement was quite clear in terms of the final goal and in terms of the means that had to be applied. However, since that time, Russian uh, economic relations have undergone quite a substantial evolution. At the turn of the century, Russia started talking uh, uh, to the European Union about more equality and therefore a concept of common spaces was put in place. And the concept of common spaces is more abstract. We don't know what a common space is. We don't know when we will come to it. Yeah? So it gives quite a lot of flexibility, but at the same time, it reminds us of the Alice in Wonderland, in the sense that if you don't know where you are going to, how will you know that you have already arrived to where you go? To where you go. So eventually, Russia and the European Union started talking about the free trade area in the framework of the WTO. So they returned. Uh, to the initial goal, but the definition of the free trade area has not been achieved, the shared definition, because the European Union wanted to have a comprehensive solution, whereas Russia was ready only to a simplistic free trade area, saying that it has to prepare for a more uh, embracing solution. Uh, in terms of the means, uh, again, Russia became very um, I'm uh, very unhappy with the unilateral uh, approximation at the turn of the century, so it started talking about convergence, implying that the European Union had to do its work as well. Uh, eventually, Russia and the European Union came to the idea that the WTO will serve as a nice platform, and because Russia is a member of the WTO, that grants Russia some quality. Uh, in terms of the construction of a free trade area, but as we already established, a free trade area is quite a distance possibility because before 2014, Russia and the European Union could not agree on the concept, and now all the uh, negotiations are frozen until the situation with Ukraine somehow regularizes. If you look at the statistics um, of the uh, trade between Russia and the European Union, and that's the most recent graph, we will see that while well, red stands for EU, EU's input, uh, green stands for EU's export, and blue stands for the trade balance. So the European Union has consistently run a trade deficit, deficit uh, with uh, Russia. Uh, it fluctuated a lot. Not so much in volume terms, rather in um, terms of, um, of, of, of value uh, because of the fluctuation in oil prices that also have uh, an impact uh, on gas prices. Yeah. But still, Russia and the European Union have uh, quite a substantial trade. Yeah. 
trade uh, with a positive balance in favor of Russia. Trade has declined um, substantially since uh, 2013. The decline started because of the change in uh, oil prices, followed by gas prices, and of course sanctions, which we will discuss uh, a bit later, contributed to that change. If you talk about the structure of trade between Russia and the European Union, it remains quite colonial in the sense that Russia mostly exports mineral resources, natural resources, oil and gas in particular, 76% of Russia's export is oil and gas, uh, and only 6% is made of manufactured goods, 1% of machinery and transport. And on the other hand, uh, the EU exports to Russia machinery and transport, and manufactured goods. Yeah? So, in a short, it's an exchange of raw materials for uh, ready goods. In terms of trade and services, the trade balance uh, is much smaller, first of all, and it's uh, in favor of the European Union. Again, this is the most recent statistics that we have. 2015 is the latest uh, uh, figure. Uh, 2014 is the figure nearby. So we see that the EU exports more services to Russia than uh, the other way around. And that tells us about the uh, state of the Russian economy, but also about uh, the interconnection between uh, Russia and the European Union in terms of various production. And the uh, next slide, uh, I'm not sure whether you can see it properly, but you can always consult the slides separately. Uh, this is a very interesting um, Comparison because it basically demonstrates that um, Russia is the third or the fourth EU trade partner yeah, with uh, about 10% uh, overall in the trade balance of the European Union, uh, whereas um, the uh, European Union uh, makes up for nearly 43% of Russia's external trade. Yeah. So that means that Russia is much more dependent on the European Union than the other way around. And this is, by the way, one of the reasons why the United States wanted to have the European Union on board when sanctions were discussed. Yeah. Trade between Russia and the United States is negligible. Trade between Russia and the European Union is very pronounced. So if you want to have an impact on Russia, you definitely need the European Union on your side. Now, let's turn more to the substantial uh, issues of uh, economic issues of uh, Russia and the European Union. And the first one is enlargement. Initially, the EU's enlargement was in the shadow of the NATO enlargement. Russia didn't pay too much attention to it, uh, being more preoccupied with security issues with the NATO. But soon, as the enlargement uh, came uh, closer to the date and became more realistic, I mean the enlargement of 2004, Russia started uh, talking about the uh, possible impact and uh, Russia raised 14 various concerns about the enlargement. And the EU didn't pay much attention to it. Uh, Russia, tried, Russia threatened not to extend the partnership and cooperation agreement to new member states. The European Union started criticizing human rights, so there was a lot of bashing about international relations, international norms, who was right and who was wrong. Eventually, yeah, as the deadline was coming to the end, Russia and the European Union reached the agreement in April 2004. Yeah. So they reached an agreement on how uh, the partnership and cooperation agreement would be extended to new members. Uh, overall, common external tariff of the new member states decreased, yeah? uh, but uh, at the same time, yeah? uh, it increased on some goods, yeah, like natural gas from 0 to 0 0.7 and aluminium from 0 to 0.26% uh, uh, of yeah? uh, to 6% uh, customer external tariff. Uh, there uh, was a decrease, uh, decreased tariff on uh, sensitive um, for Russia goods, yeah? uh, but at the same time, Russia did suffer or from a new tariff for natural resources. There was an increased uh, quotas for Russia's uh, steel yeah? that took into consideration the fact that Russia also import exporters for it. Uh, 
uh, still to new member states of the European Union and therefore the European Union had to enlarge the quota. Russia remained a member of the general system of preferences until 2012 and that meant that it could maintain beneficial trade um, uh, trade uh, uh, terms uh, with the European Union, uh, with the European Union liberalizing its trade for Russia much quicker than the other way around. Uh, there were some new transitional regimes for uh, the EU's anti-dumping regime in new member states. They were not introduced so quickly. Uh, the European Union increased quotas for nuclear materials and there was a specific uh, transit arrangement for goods uh, and people uh, transiting between the mainland of Russia and Kaliningrad. Kaliningrad being separated by uh, the EU's territory from the mainland of Russia nowadays. Yeah? So these were sort of like the, um, the conditions uh, developed uh, for um, the uh, 2004 enlargement and that made Russia reconcile uh, with uh, this enlargement. However, it left uh, a profound impact on Russia in terms of the uh, conditions because uh, trade of uh, Central and Eastern European countries was reoriented you know, more towards the European Union. Russia lost a part, a significant part of its market. And also, of course, uh, Central and Eastern European countries became natural competitors of Russia in terms of the search for foreign investments. And Russia was losing that competition precisely because uh, uh, membership in the European Union uh, granted a more uh, fair and a more predictable set of rules than uh, the regulation of Russia. The next issue that we are going to discuss is uh, Russian membership of the WTO. Uh, the partnership and cooperation agreement was very ambiguous when it comes to the WTO because on the one hand the partnership and cooperation agreement extended WTO conditions uh, to Russia without Russia being a member of the WTO. On the other hand, quite a number of provisions of the WTO, in particular free trade area, was put on hold because Russia was not a member of the WTO. Russia was uh, uh, a candidate uh, for WTO membership which uh, uh, was uh, one which took uh, one of the longest period to negotiate its uh, WTO membership. Uh, I think Russia, in terms of the record, is the second longest uh, 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 candidate uh, of the WTO, longest in terms of how long it took to negotiate the conditions. Uh, the negotiations uh, started officially in 1995 in 2004, Russia and the European Union concluded a bilateral, bilateral memorandum on the terms of Russia's accession to the WTO. Again, 2004 is not accidental here. It was linked to the EU's enlargement on the one hand and to the entry of the Kyoto Protocol into force on the other hand. So what were the issues outlined in the memorandum? They're interesting, they're important because they basically give us an idea of what was the most controversial issue in the negotiations between Russia and the European Union. Firstly, Russia agreed that its average tariff will not exceed 7.6% uh, for industrial goods, 11% for fishery, and 13% for agricultural goods. Secondly, Russia and the European Union agreed uh, that Russia will face payments for Trans-Siberian overflights. That was something imposed back in the Soviet time, and that was a payment for the right to fly over Russian territory. So this payment uh, was gradually decreased. The most controversial issue was that Aeroflot, in fact, a Russian private operator, uh, collected the money and uh, held a part of that money which was uh, considered to be an unfair uh, distortion of competition rights by the European Union. Uh, Russia agreed to open its insurance market, Russia agreed to open its banking sector, uh, with the exception that uh, EU companies cannot open branches, they can only open entities in accordance with the Russian legislation. So when you see Citibank 
in Russia or Raiffeisen Bank in Russia. It's Raiffeisen Bank Russia and not Raiffeisen Bank Austria. Although, of course, it is linked to Raiffeisen Bank Austria and in that sense there is mutual support and assistance. Uh, Russia opened uh, uh, its market for long distance calls you know, and prices decreased dramatically. It's a perfect case of competition. Russia decreased custom duties on aircraft and automobile production. Um, uh, and at the same time, Russia refused to profoundly liberalize its natural gas markets. Yeah? It agreed to increase internal prices, but at the, sa the same time, it doesn't, did not agree with the elimination of Gazprom's export monopoly. That one was preserved. Uh, Russia did not agree with the freedom of foreign operators, operators to construct pipelines. Uh, and to transit natural gas through Russia, uh, but as said, Russia agreed to increase prices and Russia agreed to implement its energy sector reform, which presupposed some unbundling of Gazprom. And we will talk what unbundling means in one of our next lectures when we discuss in details energy relations. Energy relations form such a big part of economic relations that they deserve separate attention uh, of us. So, uh, although the memorandum uh, between Russia and the European Union on the terms of Russia's accession to the WTO was concluded in 2004, uh, the next sort of like advance you know, of uh, the negotiation process did not take place quickly. And that was, uh, on the one hand, due to the fact that new member states tried to undermine the deal. And then, on the other hand, Russia announced in uh, 2009 that it was going to uh, accede the WTO, not individually, but as a member of the custom union, uh, which at the time included Russia, Belarus and Kazakhstan. In December 2010, uh, Russia and the European Union finally signed a memorandum of understanding to settle all bilateral issues of Russia's accession to the WTO. Uh, so that was clarified uh, and, um, uh, and uh, uh, therefore Russia could proceed to a multilateral phase of the negotiations with the WTO. Uh, moreover, uh, Russia agreed to become a member of the WTO individually and not as a part of the custom union. Uh, eventually, Russia signed uh, the accession agreement to the WTO in December 2011 and became a member of the WTO in August 2012. What are the consequences? Well, firstly, import duties to Russia decreased substantially. And reduced uh, duties were uh, calculated to generate uh, nearly 4 billion euro of additional EU import to Russia per year. Uh, furthermore, uh, Russia and the European Union uh, settled a substantial part of the issues that presented a problem for their economic relations, and I mean sanitary and phytosanitary rules, custom rules, rules on intellectual property rights. Uh, the WTO also provided some level playing field for Russia and the European Union and allowed them to turn to a free trade area, or at least to the discussion on a free trade area. With the accession to the WTO, Russia and the European Union uh, got a judicial instance to resolve some of their trade disputes. Remember that uh, there is no trade, uh, there is no judicial authority, supranational judicial authority for Russia and the European Union, and they always have to refer to a national court. Now, in the case of a trade issue, they can also refer to the WTO. Um, so, uh, this is basically, these are basically the results of Russia's accession to the WTO, and uh, um, what are the first results uh, of Russia's membership. Well, firstly, you know, Russia and the European Union opened several disputes against each other. The European Union was the first one to open a dispute on uh, recycling schemes for vehicles. Uh, Russia tried to protect its automobile uh, market uh, with the help of environmental fees rather than custom duties. 
Now remember that it agreed to liberalize its automobile and aviation market. The European Union, in, in, in exchange, suffered um, a, a, a suit of Russia, well, yeah, suffered a case uh, from Russia about energy corruption mechanism. Uh, the idea behind is that the European Union applies anti-dumping duties on chemical products and on steel imported from Russia because it believes that lower gas prices in Russia uh, constitute an unfair advantage for Russian producers. So the case is pending. Uh, the European Union challenged in exchange uh, um, the uh, ban on import of pork meat uh, in Russia. Russia challenged the EU's third liberalization package um, in energy. We'll talk about it in one of our next lectures, but the idea behind was that the third liberalization package uh, created disadvantages for external producers yeah, and introduced uh, some um, and introduced some um, restrictions that didn't exist before. And lastly, the European Union uh, challenged duties on uh, certain goods uh, uh, that Russia introduced. Yeah. There are also some other issues that are a bone of contention between Russia and the European Union in the WTO. For example, uh, Russia's preferential treatment of domestic producers when it comes to public procurement is one of those issues. Single economic space and then the Eurasian Economic Union um, at present present a, a difficulty for the European Union and therefore sometimes sort of are challenged in the WTO, although there is no open case about it. And then both Russia and the European Union contemplated using the WTO to challenge sanctions of the other side, but that has never happened um, because uh, uh, they decided that sanctions is a political issue and therefore there is no need to challenge that in the WTO. At the same time, Russia maintains in its public discourse that sanctions is a way to challenge the competitiveness of the Russian economy and therefore the European Union is just afraid of the competition coming from Russia. Yeah. Foreign direct investments. Foreign direct investments, again, like statistics from 2015, is the most recent one. Uh, above you see foreign direct investments in stocks and then uh, below you see foreign direct investments in flows. We see that A, uh, the EU's investments to Russia are bigger than Russian investments to the European Union. Uh, B, uh, the uh, flows are not as big yeah, as they could have been yeah, precisely because of the uncertain legal climate yeah, and uh, we have a profound capital flight as a result of sanctions imposed in 2014 uh, by Western parties, but also as a result of the unpredictable legal climate in Russia. But uh, this is an issue of sanctions that we will definitely come to a bit later. Before we come to it, I would like to address the issue of foreign direct investments. Firstly, you know, we have to realize that Russia and the European Union treat uh, foreign investments differently. Uh, Russia treats uh, foreign direct investments at micro level. And therefore, it always compares how much the European Union invested in Russia and where exactly the European Union, well, EU companies, uh, invested. And that led to a very famous statement um, of uh, Mr. Putin at the turn of the century in Portugal, where he said that actually it's not Russia that discriminates the European Union, it's actually the European Union that discriminates Russia, because Russian investments at the time were 10 times lower than EU's investments in Russia. But uh, the point of discrimination is tricky because when the European Union addresses the issue of foreign direct investments, it doesn't talk about exact amounts of money, it rather talks about possibilities, about how good the climate is or how discriminative and protective the climate is. Yeah? And therefore the EU addresses the issue in, um, at a macro level. At the same time we have to admit that already um, at around 2007-2008 when the uh, pretty sort of uh, 
cooling of the relations emerged, Russia and the European Union started dealing with reciprocal investments very cautiously. For example, Russia in 2008 adopted a law on strategic investments, which in fact foreclosed 42 sectors of the Russian economy from uh, the dominance of foreign investments. Yeah? So in these 42 sectors, yeah, um, foreign investments could not be bigger than 50%, and if investments came from a state enterprise, they couldn't be more than 25%. Yeah? And the uh, range of sectors yeah, was quite wide, from oil and gas exploration all the way to paper production. Uh, in the case of uh, mineral, uh, minerals on subsoil plots of federal importance, the shares of foreign investments were further decreased to 10% and 5% in the case of a state company. Yeah? So Russia has been adopting a clearly uh, more protective uh, sort of like agenda at the, uh, in that legislation. The EU, at the same time, also became concerned about foreign investments. In particular, it started talking about the danger of sovereign wealth funds. Not only Russian sovereign wealth funds, but international sovereign wealth funds, including Arabic funds. But basically the discussion was that there, some limits had to be put, because otherwise uh, those sovereign wealth funds invested in strategic sectors of uh, the economy of EU member states. The European Union also started talking about the principle of reciprocity in the sense that markets should be open to companies all the countries which are equally open to the European Union and EU investors. There was a famous Gazprom clause introduced in the third liberalization package, yeah, which was at the end of the day about reciprocity and about the need for Gazprom to apply the very same unbundling legislation you know, separating production, transportation and distribution in, it, in the territory of Russia before it was allowed to invest in the territory of the European Union. And of course we saw a much better consolidation of the European Union in the Lisbon Treaty, allowing for more solidarity among member states, including for the solidarity to sort of like limit foreign investments from sovereign wealth funds, Foreign investments not necessarily from Russia, but from Russia increasingly uh, more and more. Next issue of economic importance or importance for economic relations is an issue of Eurasian integration. We already talked about Eurasian integration in one of our previous meetings when we discussed political issues and when we discussed uh, the problem of uh, competition between the European Union and Russia in the post-Soviet uh, uh, space. Now let's talk about Eurasian economic integration in more economic terms. Uh, the current Eurasian Economic Union emerged as a result of the Custom Union. The decision was made in 2009 and came into force in 2010. Yeah. The borders were eventually abolished on the 1st of July 2011. Then there was a single economic space set up in 2010 and uh, put in place in 2012 yeah. and on the 1st of uh, July 2012 the Eurasian Economic Commission started to work uh, in its present setting and finally the Eurasian Economic Union emerged in January 2015 um, you know, initially three member states signed the relevant agreement and these are Russia, Belarus and Kazakhstan and then uh, two more, Armenia and Kyrgyzstan, joined the Eurasian Economic Union a bit later. Yeah, so the Eurasian Economic Union is an integration entity and Russia insists on its supranationality. But at the same time, in contrast to the European Union, it's a purely economic bloc. And this is something that is also emphasized by all member states of the Eurasian Economic Union. So the Eurasian Economic Union eventually, in essence, is about a single market. Yeah? with the free circulation of goods, services, capital and people. Yeah? So the uh, uh, circulation of goods and services is probably the easiest. That's the same as we know about the European Union. Uh, 
freedom of labor movement is actually easy and rush in, in the Eurasian Economic Union compared to the European Union due to the language proficiency, uh, Russian language proficiency. Uh, freedom of capital movement yeah, still is still being installed. And then of course there is a policy in energy and transport and a single economic policy in various fields. So that's in a nutshell a scheme of the Eurasian Economic uh, union when it comes to the substance of policy. So what about the relations between the EU and the Eurasian Economic Union? In, in short, the European Union does not recognize the Eurasian Economic Union. Yeah? Uh, and there are many reasons for that. Well, first of all, um, a pretext for the European Union not to recognize the Eurasian Economic Union is the fact that not all member states of the Eurasian Economic Union are members of the WTO and therefore the Eurasian Economic Union is not officially recognized in the WTO. Secondly, the European Union says that, look, the Eurasian Economic Union does not function as a proper custom union. Any case on sanctions yeah, demonstrates it to us very well. On the one hand, Russia introduced unilaterally sanctions against the European Union and the United States and a number of other countries. On the other hand, Belarus and less so Kazakhstan helped to bypass um, Russian sanctions yeah? and uh, these uh, countries emerged as the biggest channels for the export of Western goods. Uh, the European Union also says that the Eurasian Economic Union is not a proper economic union but rather a, an illustration of Russian imperial uh, ambitions yeah? and therefore Geopolitics rather than economics uh, drive, uh, drive it. Um, the European Union talks that uh, it needs to double check whether the Eurasian member states are happy with this um, arrangement. And this is in line with the EU's logic that post Soviet countries have to be given a choice to freely define their political and economic policy. Yeah, and freely means orienting themselves towards the European Union. Uh, the European Union also says that uh, it's, um, the Eurasian Economic Union is a tactical arrangement for Russia, in a way, uh, to, in effect, duplicate, to um, imitate on the Russian side what the European Union has been doing in uh, the sense of, uh, uh, in the sense of, um, played with national and supranational levels uh, when talking to Russia. Now Russia says, well, look, the Eurasian Economic Union is a supranational entity, some competences were transferred there, so you don't have to talk to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russia, you actually have to talk to the Eurasian Economic Commission. Yeah? So in that sense, the European Union accuses Russia of using the Eurasian Economic Union in tactical uh, ways rather than in strategic ways. At the same time, there are informal technical contacts between the European Union and the Eurasian Economic Union. And Russia copies quite a lot of standards uh, of the European Union. Uh, and in that sense, there was a technical alignment, which of course is extremely important. And the last issue that we are going to cover today is the issue of sanctions. Again, we're not going to talk about the political, political uh, logics of sanctions. We covered it in the previous lecture, but we are definitely going to talk about uh, the economic impact of sanctions. Uh, the European Union in 2014, as a result of the events in Ukraine, introduced four different stages of sanctions. It started with the, free of, with the freeze of the long-term agenda with Russia, yeah, so the new post-partnership and cooperation agreement, agreement between Russia and the European Union, was uh, was frozen, yeah? so it's not under the discussion anymore. Well, it's put aside. Yeah? It's still under the discussion, but it's put aside, and the parties don't discuss it. Yeah? Similarly, Russia and the European Union do not discuss any longer any free trade area or any visa liberalization. Yeah? So all long-term issues are put aside, yeah? and that's important for economic relations. Secondly, uh, the uh, certain individuals and companies were blacklisted. Uh, by the European Union. The European Union blacklisted companies and individuals that were 
according to its opinion, directly linked to what happened in Ukraine in 2014, be it Crimea or Eastern Ukraine. The European Union also introduced sanctions on uh, Crimea, uh, which uh, in fact ban all operations um, uh, with Crimean companies. Yeah. European companies cannot engage in any sort of economic activity with the companies in Crimea. And lastly, in uh, summer and in, in July, August, and September 2014, uh, the European Union introduced uh, sectoral sanctions. And those are financial sanctions which limit possibilities for loan credits for Russian companies. Uh, these are limits on the supply of dual use goods and military goods to Russia. And these are limits on the supply of. Uh, Technologies for oil drilling, especially in the extreme weather conditions and in water. You know, technologies in which Russia is quite dependent on Western producers. Russia retaliated, first it blacklisted some EU officials and business people, yeah, and this blacklisting was confidential in many ways and quite hectic. Secondly, Russia introduced uh, ban on the import of many agricultural products from the European Union, as well as from other countries that introduced sanctions against Russia. That includes vegetables, fruit, milk products, meat products. And um, uh, therefore, uh, yeah, this was the way for Russia to respond to um, EU measures. The estimated effect of sanctions, in fact, varies on the Russian side and on the EU side. Um, the uh, problem uh, with the estimation is that it's actually very difficult to decide uh, what economic problems are due to um, long-term problems in the Russian economy you know, that existed already before sanctions, which uh, economic issues are the result of the decrease of oil and gas prices, and which uh, economic effect is actually the result of sanctions. Yeah? So because it's very difficult to dissociate, we um, uh, have uh, a, problem, a problem with it. Uh, at the same time, uh, the estimates you know, say that uh, about 75 billion euro is uh, lost by each part, and that's about 5% of the GDP of Russia and about 0.6% of the EU's GDP. Uh, in terms of the uh, qualitative effect on the Russian economy, we had a profound devaluation of ruble and inflation. The inflation is also due to the fact that competition between Russian goods and uh, Western goods is not in place any longer. So therefore, Russian producers can actually charge a bigger price for um, goods which are not necessarily of high quality. There is a lack of investments, then problems with international finance. Uh, Russia uh, definitely uh, understood that sanctions is a long-term issue and therefore it engaged into a program of import substitution. At the same time, we didn't witness uh, a any massive liberalization of the Russian economy, despite all the promises from the leadership of Russia. And of course, uh, sanctions contributed to the contradictions in the Eurasian integration, in the sense that some Eurasian partners helped to bypass um, Russian sanctions. And therefore, um, Belarus, for example, emerged as one of the largest producers of mussels and avocado. Uh, Russia is definitely dependent on financial markets in the West, and that's very well demonstrated. Russia is dependent on uh, technologies from the West, and that's also very well illustrated uh, with uh, sanctions and with their preliminary results. Russia remains very sensitive to oil prices, and of course uh, sanctions contributed to social vulnerability in Russia in the sense that um, the most disadvantaged uh, layers of the population suffered the most due in particular to the uh, inflation in the uh, food products. Uh, at the same time, uh, Russia believes that uh, sanctions 
are not, Western sanctions are not legitimate because Russia does not consider itself a party in the conflict in Ukraine. And also because, according to the international law, only the United Nations, and in particular the, Secretary, the Security Council, uh, have the right to impose sanctions. All the others, Russia, all other sanctions, Russia deliberately calls restrictive measures. Secondly, uh, the logic of Russia is that we didn't opt for the sanctions, and we are not going to negotiate about sanctions. You imposed it, so it's up to you to decide how to get rid of them. Yeah? We are not a part in the conflict, Russia says. Yeah? And the Minsk agreement is the agreement between, the, between central authorities in Kyiv and uh, eastern Ukraine, and not between Ukraine and Russia, and therefore Russia cannot be a uh, Hostage uh, cannot be a hostage uh, to the Minsk agreements. That's the official rhetoric of the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Furthermore, Russia tries to drive a wedge between the European Union and the United States, saying that the European Union is was forced into sanctions. Uh, that the, European, the United States uh, are playing the major role in these sanctions, and that. Uh, the European Union, in fact, loses quite a lot as a result of sanctions. Russia also uh, stigmatizes uh, the EU's perverted solidarity. That's a quote from the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And also we have to admit that despite sanctions, uh, we uh, have an, an amazing consolidation of the Russian society and the Russian state, and actually, uh, if anything, sanctions strengthen that consolidation, which again is not a, a Russian phenomenon. It's a phenomenon which is well known uh, from the start of sanctions of the past years. It's a phenomenon of rally around the flag, uh, of uh, a rally that contributes to the cohesion of the society and the state as a result of this sort of feeling of being under the siege. Yeah. So this is how Russia sees sanctions. The European Union is clearly consolidated on the anti-Russian basis. Yeah. There is a certain surge in unemployment in some segments linked to trade in Russia, but at the same time that's, it's balanced with some market substitution on the part of the European Union and in the case of EU farmers with some subsidies to EU farmers. Uh, EU producers understand that they can lose a part of Russian market potentially, due to import substitution and due to the fact that companies from BRICS countries will come to fill the vacuum, uh, but at the same time that does not challenge the coherence of the European Union. Occasionally some member states talk about the need to review sanctions, but at the same time sanctions have been rolled over since 2014. And there are different generations of sanctions, different stages of sanctions. So something is being rolled over every two or three months. And um, since 2014, the European Union has not had any problem in finding unanimity about sanctions. Uh, sanctions have uh, different impacts uh, on different member states. Yeah? So there is a variation in how much, in how much member states are affected. But there is no uh, correlation between how much a member state is affected and how willing it is to eliminate sanctions. Yeah? For example, the Baltic countries are probably the most affected because of Russian counter sanctions, but at the same time they are the most, uh, the biggest proponents of maintaining sanctions against Russia. Yeah? So in that sense, uh, the political and economic rationales for sanctions uh, are different for various member states of the European Union. Companies at the same time overcomply with sanctions yeah, due to the strictness of the EU's regulation, but also due to but also due to the extraterritorial effect of the US sanctions, where US officials believe that they can punish companies across the world if they violate the US sanctions. There is a good synchronization, yeah, although not complete synchronization, between the US sanctions and the EU sanctions. And that, of course, contributes to the compliance and over-compliance of Western companies with the sanctions regime. 
So this is where we stand now and this is where our economic relations stand now. We see a clear deterioration of economic relations. We only do some crisis management when it comes to some uh, problematic issue in trade. Uh, but at the same time, we don't discuss any long-term issues, we don't discuss any free trade area, we don't discuss any future arrangements between Russia and the European Union, and economic relations in general are clearly a hostage to the political and security uh, problems uh, that uh, currently exist in EU-Russian relations. And this is the end of our lecture on economic relations. Uh, I will wrap it up here, but I will... Uh, invite you to our new lectures which will be devoted to energy, yeah, energy being the biggest part of EU-Russian economic relations.